has no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me now save am I will not love lifted me you know that love lifted me well when nothing else could help love lifted me he will lifted me yes love lifted me you know that we nothing else could help love lifted in me Good morning, church. Good morning, sir. I'd like to welcome everyone. If we have any visitors with us, you are our honored guest this morning. Before we go into our service, I have a few announcements I would like to read off. We'd like prayers for the Swales family. Brother and sister Swales lost their youngest daughter to cancer. We'd like to keep them in our prayers. Yeah. Also, Brother Wash McCall passed on Friday. The minister from the Akron Church of Christ, he passed on Friday. So keep them in our prayers. Also, we want to continue to pray for, pray for the uh, Patterson family on the loss of our brother, dear Floyd Patterson. Keep them in prayers. Also, we want to keep brother Robert Cottingham in prayers. He'll be having an upcoming procedure done in November. Also, Sister Sandra Lawrence. I want to keep her in our, pray in our prayers for continued success with her fight with cancer. Sister Emma Brown has requested prayer for Sister Cornelia Swing. Sister Ruth Wade has requested prayer for Brother William Wade, who will be having his a procedure done on November the 5th. Sister Gina Slade reports that her mother, Laura Brown, surgery went well. Please continue to pray for her. We want to continue to pray for all of us who have lost loved ones, all of our brothers and sisters who are at home and can't be with us, but they would love to be with us. Today is our fifth Sunday collection today. I want to remind you that our virtual classes for men and women will be every third and fourth Sunday from five to six. Remember all of our sick and shed-ins. Remember to continue to pray for the leadership here at university. These are all the announcements that I have for this morning. On our roster this morning, I'm Brother Frank Barnes. Our song lead will be Brother Greg Shields. Meditation in Scripture, Brother Donald Nelson. Our prayer, Brother Nate Wright, Sr. Message will be given by Brother Terrence McLean. Communion today will be given by Brother Elijah Toller. Amen. Benediction will be Brother Raymond Knight. Response facilitator will be Brother Amos Hicks. I will be back for the offering. Once again, I'm Brother Frank Barnes, and you have been called to worship. Let us go to God in prayer. To our Father, our God, we thank you once again for this day that you have given us to come and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that you continue to comfort those through your words who have lost loved ones. Continue to bless our second <coughs> sick and shut-in, that they will be able to come and join us once again to worship you in spirit and in truth. To all that will be having procedures done, we pray, Father, that everything will go well with them. We know that you are the master healer and that all things are possible through you. Yes. Father, we pray for our minister who will be delivering the message this morning that everything will be done according to your will. Yes. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I just hate it when somebody come up and just starts singing and don't even say, don't have the courtesy to say good morning. Good morning, y'all. <laughs> Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better. Goodbye, and I will sing it by and by. Lord, away the morning card, we'll and all the saints of God a gathering right away. We'll tell the story of how we've overcome. We will. Understand it better by and by. We are often destitute of the things that life demands a want of shelter and a food, a thirsty hills and barren land. But we're trusting in the Lord. And according to his word, I what we'll understand it better by and by. We sing it by and by. Lord, we the morning call, I will and all the say of God, the gathering, and we will tell the story of how we overcome, or we will understand it better by and by. A temptation hid in snare often take us unaware and our hearts are made to bleed for we thoughtless word or deed and we wonder why the tears when we try to do our best but we will understand it better by and we sing it by and my Lord, away the morning comes, away and all the saints of God are gathering, oh, and we will tell the the story of how we overcome or we will understand it better by and by. we sing it by my Lord away the morning come a will and all the saints of God are gathering when we will tell the story of how we overcome or we will understand it better Amen we will understand all this better by and by and by, he's sweet, I know, oh, he's sweet, I know, you know the storm clouds me with your eyes and strong winds me. Will you know that I'll tell the word, I'll tell it away. 
say that I, I found the sea in you and he's sweet I know we're going to sing one more verse uh, one more verse of that song and the reason I like this song because it means different things to different people different things to different people let's go ahead and sing and make it real personal to you he's sweet I know okay after that we're going to have meditation and scripture reading one time he's sweet I know oh, he's sweet I know you know the storm clouds may they will rise and strong winds may blow where you know that I'll tell the world I'll tell him wherever I go I'll see that I found the Savior and he sweet well maybe one more maybe one more oh he sweet yeah only you know what God has done for you he sweet I know you the storm cloud may they're gonna rise and strong winds may blow will you know that I'll tell the world I'll tell it away meditation is taken from Philippians Philippians first chapter verses 1 through 6 Philippians 1 verses 1 through 6 it's also in the insert of our informer in case you pick one up as you came in Paul and Timotheus mm -hmm. the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident in this very thing, that we which have begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. God bless the readers and hearers of his word. Today's scripture is from John, the 13th chapter. John 13. Come on. Verse 1. John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel 
and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wash them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. Peter said unto him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Mm -hmm. Jesus said unto him, what I am doing you do not understand now, right. but you will know after this. Yes, sir. Then Peter said unto him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, he who is bathed need only to wash his feet, but is completely need, he who is needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. But you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said unto them, do you know what I have done unto you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Mm -hmm. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Amen. Most assuredly, I say to you, mm -hmm. a servant is not greater than his master, right. nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Right. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Mm -hmm. God bless those hearers and the doers of his word. Now, please let us stand as we prepare for prayer. Please stand. Oh, my trials, oh, my king, I can tell them to my Lord. Let us bow, please. All wise and gracious Father in heaven, Father, it is with gratitude and in praise unto you that we come before your throne of grace. Yes, yes. We come, dear Lord, thanking you for this day. 
thanking you for this time that you've given us, dear Lord. We have come to this place, dear Lord, as fellow Christians with kindred minds and spirits. Well, well, well. And we have come here to, to worship you and to worship you in spirit Amen. and in truth. Amen. We're just so grateful, dear Lord, for all your blessings that you continually bless us with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And dear Lord, we're just thankful for all that you have done and continue to do for us. Father, you have blessed us to come through this week. And you have blessed us with, by continuing to give us physical health and strength and the right exercise of our minds. You have blessed us in so many ways, dear Lord. We cannot count the ways that you have blessed us. And we appreciate all of those blessings all, and the grace that you continue to shower upon us. But most of all, dear Lord, we thank you for the most precious gift that you could have given us. And that is the gift of your son, Jesus the Christ, who laid down his life for the sins of the world. And that through his death, burial, and resurrection, all of mankind has a right to the tree of life if we are obedient to the things that you have commanded of us to do. And we pray, dear Lord, that we will be faithful to your word and, and that we will uh, endeavor to teach your word to others, that others may be led to your son. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us this opportunity to come before you. And we're just so thankful for your word, dear Lord, for you. We know that your word is able to save our souls. Amen. And we pray that as we hear your word, that we will internalize it, apply it to our everyday lives, that others may see that your spirit dwells within us and that we bow to your will, that your will be done on earth. <clears throat> as it is in heaven. Dear Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, our minister who will shortly come before us to proclaim your word. And we pray that we will have open minds and receptive hearts to embrace those things that we hear and go about and teach those things to others so that others may one day ask, what must I do in order to be saved? Continue to bless him, dear Lord, and we ask that you continue to bless uh, the leaders of this congregation. Be with them and just uh, and keep them in your care and strengthen them as they endeavor to do the things for the growth of the congregation and for the glorification of you. Thank you, dear Lord, for this time, and thank you for allowing us to come together. And Father, we ask that you look upon those who have lost loved ones, who are grieving at this time, dear Lord. We think about the Patterson family who has lost a loved one, and, and Wash McCall, who, has, who was a minister of your word, dear Lord. Be with this family and just bless the entire McCall family. And also, dear Lord, bless the uh, Swells family at the loss of their loved one. Comfort all of those who uh, are grieving, dear Lord, as, as only you can comfort them. And Father, there are those whose names have been called who are dealing with uh, illnesses. Be with them, dear Lord, and and just be uh, with the ones who are caring for them, the doctors and the nurses and, and all the others who are doing what they can in order to be a benefit to those who are uh, dealing with illness. There are many more, dear Lord, whose names was not called, but you know who they are. Yeah. Be with them and just continue to keep your arms of health and healing around them and restore them to a reasonable portion of health and strength. Yes, yes.
that they may be able to go about their daily lives. We're just so grateful, dear Lord, for all that you continue to do for us. And there are many other things, dear Lord, that uh, we could place before you. But we just want to say thank you. thank you. Thank you for the dearest gift that you could have given. We're thankful for your blessings, for your grace, and for your mercy. That's right. That's right. But most of all, we're thankful for the gift of your son, Jesus, and the gift that he gave to all of us. These and all blessings we do ask. Through Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Don't know about you, but I know God has brought me through some stuff. He has brought me through some, <laughs> through some stuff. I love to pray. He's here. I love the praises and I love to pray. It's here we I love the praises and I love to pray. It's here I love the praises. Oh, I love to praise His holy name. Well, He's my rock. He's my rock, my rock, my rock, my sword and shield. Oh, he's the will, the will in the middle of the will. I know he'll never, he'll never, never let me die. Oh, he's just a jewel, a jewel that I. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I love to praise him. I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I love to praise him. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I love to praise him. Oh, I love. Holy name, well, he's my rock. He's my rock. My rock, my rock, my sword and shield. Oh, he's the will. He's the will. The will in the middle of the way. Oh, I know he will never, oh, he will never. I never let me down. He's just a jewel, a jewel that I have Oh, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Well, I love the praises, and I'm singing Hallelujah. Hallelujah, well, I love the praises, and I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah, well, I love the praises, oh, I love to pray, oh, I love to, oh, I love to pray. His holy name. We introduced this. So we introduced the song a couple of weeks ago. Sorry, brother. McClendon. I'm sure they're ready to hear the message as well. <laughs> so, uh, it's one and repeated song. One and repeated song. I'll say something, then you guys say it right back to me. Okay. <clears throat> Lord, the people praise you. Lord, the people praise you. Lift you up and raise you. Oh, you are the Holy One. Yeah, you're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. So if I had 10,000 tongues. If I had 10,000 tongues. Yeah, I would praise you with every word. Oh, you are the only one. You're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. If I had 10,000 hands. If I had 
I'll praise you as you come in. Oh, you are the only one. Yeah, you're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. We say hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, the people adore you. Say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All the people praise you. Oh, you are the only one. You are the only one. Say you're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. Amen. You're the one. You're the only one. The sovereign ruler of the universe. The God who in the beginning spoke and it was so. Commanded and it stood fast. He is the God in whom we move and live and have our very being. And yet with all of that omnipotence, all of that power, he so loved us that he gave his only begotten son who stripped himself of his glory in heaven, was wrapped in human flesh, came to this earth and died on the cross for our sins, got up on the third day according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven on high after having paid a debt that he did not owe for a crime that he did not commit. God is certainly worthy of our worship and of our praise on this morning. And we are thankful for Brother Frank Barnes for ushering us into the presence of God Almighty, Brother Greg Shills, as he always does, in leading us in heartfelt songs of praise to God and for Brother Donald Nelson for the meditation and the reading of the scripture. And we certainly appreciate Brother Nate Wright Sr. leading us to the throne of grace in prayer. Thank you for all of, all of those that you prayed for, Brother Nate, but especially thank you for praying for the McCall family in the transition of Brother Wash McCall, a great gospel preacher. Uh, we want to continue to pray for his wife and daughter as well as the North Hill Church. We want to continue to pray for Brother Adriel Wilson, who came under the tutelage of Brother Wash McCall. And so did Brother Lawrence Moore two preachers that have been sent out from North Hill and their families, we know they are grieving in a unique kind of way. Again, we want to remember Brother Arnold and Brother James Patterson and their entire family as they and all of us grieve the passing of Brother Floyd Patterson. We want to remember the Church of Christ at the Boulevard for it was a great loss for them, and especially do we want to remember their evangelist, their minister, Brother Mark Parker. Uh, Brother Floyd worked very closely uh, with the preacher there, and we know that his heart breaks just like all of our hearts break. But we thank God that he is the God of all comfort. And he has comforted us so that we might be able to comfort others in their, in their time of, of need. Amen. For those of you who are visiting with us, thank you for being here. For those of you who are visiting via Facebook Live or watching later on Facebook, watching later on YouTube, for those who are on the teleconference call, thank you for joining us. 
We are a people who love the Lord and we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We believe that there is one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in us all. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Our prayer is that you will sense our love for God and our love for you and our love for one another. If you have questions about what you see here or experience as you join us in whichever way you join us, please don't hesitate to ask us. Peter said, we as the children of God are to sanctify God in our hearts. Be ready always to give an answer concerning the hope that is within us with meekness and with, with fear. Amen. Please continue to keep Sister Linda McLean in, in prayer as she continues to battle health issues. She was fully planning to be here on this morning. In fact, she tried to rest all weekend and not be too active so that she could join us, but she is not feeling her best, so please keep her in prayer as well for the surgery that she is scheduled to have on November 12th, totally separate from the epilepsy, but continue to lift her as well as all of our, our sick and those you've heard that were announced that are going to have surgeries or procedures or tests Please re remember them as well. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity to come together and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Yes, Lord. Father, we pray that all that we have done up to this point in this service has been pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Thank you for all of our brothers who have led us in various aspects of worship. Others who will follow this message and lead us in the Lord's Supper and in giving as you have prospered us and the benediction. Father, our desire is just to please you. You are an audience of one. It doesn't really matter how anybody else feels in this place or watching. What matters is when we are done, whether you have been pleased with our worship. I humbly thank you for the opportunity to stand once again and to share a thought from your word. Father, may I hide in the shadow of the cross. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you will get glory from this message, that Jesus will indeed be lifted up so all will be drawn to him. I pray that the saints of God who are watching, listening, participating will be strengthened. And Father, our prayer is that those who are lost in sin separated from you because of sin. Use me to remind them that, that as you said through Isaiah, that your ears are not dull, that you cannot hear. That's right, that's right. And your hand is not slack, that you cannot save. Thank you, Lord. But their sins and their iniquity separated between them and their God. That principle holds true even at this moment. Please use me. Please take this word and convict all of our hearts. Wherever we need to make correction. Help us, O oh Lord. Thank you for Jesus, your son. Who died for our sins. You raised him for our justification. He's on your right hand making intercession, even at this moment. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. 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 
we live in a very proud and egotistical generation. It is now considered acceptable and even normal for people to promote themselves, to praise themselves, and to put themselves first. Everyone, it seems, is screaming for his or her own rights and seeking to be recognized as someone important. The preoccupation with self-esteem, self-love, and self-glory is destroying the very foundations upon which our society was built. When all people are committed first to themselves, relationships disintegrate. That is what is happening in friendships, in marriages, in families, and society as it falls apart. Sadly, the preoccupation with self has found its way into the church. Where for many, the emphasis is on pride, self-esteem, self-image, self-fulfillment, and other manifestations of self-ism. Right. Scripture is clear that self-ism has no place in the teachings of Scripture. Jesus repeatedly taught against pride and with his life and teaching he constantly exalted the virtue of humility. Over the past week I have been doing my regular devotionals and I've added one that's entitled The Life of Jesus and it's in 10 parts, 49 segments and and near the end of the week, I came to this situation in John chapter 13. Okay. When Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And it seems that everywhere I turn, there, there are those, even in the Lord's church, who are grasping for power. last night of Jesus earthly ministry was very eventful he prayed his great high priestly prayer he taught his disciples many valuable truths he observed the Passover meal with his disciples and was betrayed into the hands of his enemies through all of this Jesus knows that in the morning he will go to Calvary and die on a cross for the sin of humanity. His is a bitter cup. But Jesus takes some time to teach these men a lesson in servanthood that still speaks to us today. In the verses that Brother Donald read, Jesus reveals his heart and his mission. He proves to these men that he did not come to be served, but to serve. Right. Think about the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verse number 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In showing himself to be a servant of men, Jesus left us a vivid portrait of the kind of heart we ought to have for others. And I want to make it clear that as I have observed and as I have listened, I have also done some self-reflection because I don't want to be one of those folk who is grasping for power. I don't want to be one of those folk who have to remind people that I am somebody. I don't want to be a servant. Nothing more and nothing less. 
So we turn to this text, and the sermon is a very simple one. No fancy titles, it simply is that Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Our study is going to come from John chapter 13, verse 1 through 17, but I'm going to come from the New King James Version, if that's all right with you. And for emphasis sake, I want to read the word of God. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. That's right. That's right. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was keenly aware of a heavenly timetable. In the Gospel of John, the second chapter, verse 4, when his mother asked him to perform a miracle at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, he said, my hour has not yet come. During his ministry, it was noted several times that his enemies could not take him because his hour had not yet come. We see that in John 7 verse 30 and John 8 verse 20. As we come to the last days, however, of his personal ministry, it is stressed again and again that the hour had come. In John 12 verse 23, 
But Jesus answers them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man is to be glorified. Again in John 13, 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. In John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Jesus was acutely aware that the shadow of the cross was growing longer and longer. Jesus had less than 15 hours to live at this juncture in John 13. And before that hour came, Jesus had much to share with his disciples. His public discourses were finished, but in the intimacy of the upper room, Jesus wanted to meet with his disciples and discuss important truths with them. John chapter 13 marks a turning point in John's gospel and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus' public ministry to the nation of Israel had run its course and ended in her complete and final rejection of him as the Messiah. On the first day of the week, Jesus had entered Jerusalem in triumph to the enthusiastic shouts of the people. Those people nevertheless misunderstood his ministry and his message. The Passover season had arrived and by Friday he would be utterly rejected and executed. Amen. God, however, would turn that execution into the great and final sacrifice for sin. And Jesus would die as the true Passover lamb. Now it is the day before Jesus' death. And rather than being preoccupied with thoughts of his death, sin bearing, and glorification, Jesus is totally consumed with his love for his disciples. Knowing that he would soon go to the cross to die for the sins of the world, he is still concerned with the needs of these 12 men. All right, all right, all right. His love is never impersonal. That's the mystery of it. Yes. In what were literally the last hours before his death, Jesus kept showing them his love over and over. And John relates this graphic demonstration of it in John 13, verse 1 through 17. It is very likely that Jesus and the disciples have been hiding at Bethany during this final week before the crucifixion. If you look at John chapter 12 verse 1 and John chapter 12 verse 36, we kind of get this idea. Having come from Bethany or from anywhere near Jerusalem, they would have had to travel on extremely dirty roads. Naturally, by the time they arrived, their feet were covered with dust from the road. Everyone in the culture faced the same problem. Sandals did little to keep dirt off the feet, and the roads were either a thick layer of dust or deep masses of mud. All right, all right. At the entrance to every Jewish home was a large pot of water to wash dirty feet. And normally foot washing was the duty of the lowliest slave. When guests came, he had to go to the door and wash their feet, a very unpleasant task. In fact, washing feet was probably his most abject duty and only slaves performed it for others. Even the disciples of rabbis were not to wash the feet of their masters. That was uniquely the task of a slave. Let me give you a little bit more background so you can really understand what's going on in John chapter 13. In a lesson from Truth for the Day, copyright 1994 and 1998, page 2, entitled Lessons of the Town, this is what the writer shares about this background. Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself about, verses 3a and verse 4. Jesus and his disciples were not seated as portrayed in Da Vinci's masterpiece, The Last Supper. They were not sitting in ladder back chairs behind a long dining table. Rather, they lay on their left sides on a thin mat or rug, leaning on their left elbows, eating with their right hands. 
They broke off pieces of bread, dipped them into the dishes before them, and then popped the bread into their mouth. As you picture this scene in your mind, see Jesus and the twelve lying in a row around a low table, their bodies close together, with the feet of each man not far from the face of the man next to him. It is in that setting that Jesus rose from the table and prepared to wash the disciples' feet. Washing feet was an essential part of the social scene in that day. When one was invited to dinner, normally he would bathe himself and start for the meal clean from head to toe. However, the piles of Palestine were dirty, filled with refuse. Remember that animals also used these same pies. If it had rained, the roads were also muddy. Since all wore sandals, when the guests arrived at the host's house, he would still be clean from his head to below his knees. But his feet and angles, ankles were generally filthy. All right. A good host kept a large container of water at the entrance to his house, along with a jar, a basin, and towels. When one entered the house, he took off his shoes and someone washed his feet. Normally this was done by a slave, for it was considered the most degrading of tasks. It was so debasing that a Hebrew slave could not be forced to wash the feet of guests. Only Gentile slaves could be commanded to do it. If there was no servant to wash the feet of his guests, a good host did this himself. And if there was no host, as was the case in the upper room, the guests washed each other's feet. It was unthinkable to recline to eat with unclean feet. That give you a better picture of what's going on? And as Jesus and his disciples arrived in the upper room, they found there was no servant all right, all right. to wash their feet. Why, why aren't the disciples washing each other's feet? Yes, yes. Why don't they even think about washing Jesus' feet? Amen. Well, let me help you better understand this. Only days before, Jesus had said to the twelve in Matthew 20, verse 26 and 27, Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. That's right, that's right. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. If they had given mind and heart to his teaching, one of the twelve would have washed the other's feet, or they would have mutually shared the tie. It could have been a beautiful thing, but it never occurred to them because of their selfishness. Well, Brother McClain, you're being kind of hard on them. I know the Holy Spirit was hard on them. Because if you look at the parallel passage in Luke chapter 22, verse 24 through 26, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. Jesus said, why are you arguing about who is the greatest? You need to be a servant. Why then were the disciples around the table with unwashed feet? They were bickering about who was the greatest. And in an argument about who is the greatest, no one is going to get down to the ground and wash feet. The basin was there, the towel was there, everything was ready, but no one moved to wash the other's feet. John 13, 1 says that Jesus knew his hour was come, he was on a divine time schedule, and he knew that he was going to be with the Father. He was very conscious of that fact because verse 3, he said he would soon be going to God. But instead of being concerned with his glory and 
in spite of their selfishness, he was conscious of revealing clearly his personal love to the twelve. All right, all right. That they might be secure in it. Verse 1 simply puts it this way. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. To the end in the Greek is ace telos, and it means that he loved them to perfection. He loved them to the uttermost. He loved them with total fullness of love. That's the nature of Christ's love, and he showed it over and over again, even in his death. When he was arrested, he arranged that the disciples would not be arrested in John 18, 8. When he was on the cross, he made sure that John would give his mother Mary a home and care for her in years to come, John 19, verse 26 and 27. He reached out to a dying thief even as he hung there on the cross and said, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. In Luke 23 and verse 43. It is amazing that in those last hours of carrying the sins of the world, during all the pain and suffering he was bearing, he was conscious of that man hanging next to him. Jesus loves utterly, absolutely, to perfection, totally, completely, and without reservation. And now when most men would have been wholly concerned with himself, he selflessly humbled himself to meet the needs of others. Genuine love is like that. And here is the great lesson of this whole account. Only absolute humility can generate absolute love. It is the nature of agape love to be selfless, not selfish. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul said that love does not seek its own. In fact, to distill all the truth of 1 Corinthians 13 into one statement, we might say that the greatest virtue of love is its humility. It's the humility of love that proves that it and makes it visible. Christ's love and his humility are inseparable. He could not have been so consumed with a passion for serving others if he had been primarily concerned with himself. You and I are to love indeed and truth. How could anyone reject that kind of love? Men do it all the time. Amen. Judas did. Brother Greg Shields, one of our elders, had a great lesson for the men on Judas in our men's class. I never had a, sat in on a study on, on, on Judas. Judas was something. But watch this. Verse 2 says, And supper being ended, the devil having already Put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The devil didn't just get in Judas that night. He'd already been there. Do you see the tragedy of Judas? He was constantly experiencing the love of Christ. He went with Christ. He heard Christ's teachings. He saw Christ's miracles. He ate with Christ. And yet he hated Christ at the same time. The contrast between Jesus and Judas is striking and perhaps that's the very reason the Holy Spirit included verse 2 in this passage. Yet against the background of Judas' hatred, Jesus' love shines even brighter. We can better understand its magnitude when we understand that in the heart of Jesus was the blackest kind of hatred and rejection. The words of love by which Jesus gradually drew the hearts of the other disciples to himself only pushed Judas further and further away. 
The teaching by which he uplifted the souls of the other disciples seemed to drive a stake into the heart of Judas. And everything that Jesus said in terms of love must have become like chafing shackles to Judas from his fettered greed in John chapter 12 verse number 6 and his apparent disappointment that Jesus didn't appear to be the kind of Messiah they were looking for began to spring jealousy, spite, and hatred and now he was ready to destroy Destroy Christ if necessary. But the more men hated Jesus and desired to hurt him, the more it seemed he manifested love to them. It would be easy to understand resentment. It would be easy to understand bitterness. But all Jesus had was love. He even met the greatest injury with supreme love. In a little while, he would be kneeling at the feet of Judas. The one he knew who was about to betray him. And washing his feet. Jesus waited until everyone was seated and supper was served. Then in an overwhelming act of humility... That must have stunned the disciples. Verse 4 and 5 says this. Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Remember, these old dirty feet didn't just have a little dust on them. These old dirty feet had dust from the road, roads that animals had walked on, roads that animals had done their business on, roads that had rained on, where there was mud and you didn't know what else was in there. And here is Jesus down on his knee washing their dirty feet. With calmness and majesty and total silence, Jesus stood up, walked over, took the pitcher, poured the water into the basin, removed his garments, put a towel around his waist, knelt to wash the feet of his disciples, yes, one by one. What a profound lesson that should have been for them. What a profound lesson that needs to be for us. Sadly, the church is full of people who are standing on their dignity when they ought to be kneeling at the feet of their brother or sister. Someone else has said this, too many of us are standing in dignity, hands folded, when we should be kneeling in service, washing feet. The desire for prominence in the body of Christ breaks my heart. I know it breaks God's heart. The prominence, the desire for prominence is death to love, death to humility, and death to service. One who is proud and self-centered has no capacity for love or humility. All right, all right. Consequently, any service he or she may think he or she is performing for the Lord is a waste of time. When you are tempted to think of your dignity, your prestige, or your rights, you need to open your Bible to John 13 and get a good look at Jesus, clothed like a slave, kneeling, washing dirt off the feet of sinful men who are utterly indifferent to his impending death. That's right. That's right. To go from being God in glory Verse 3, to washing the feet of sinful and glorious disciples in verses 4 and 5 is a long step. Yes. Think about this. The majestic, glorious God of the universe comes to earth. That's humility. And then he kneels on the ground to wash the feet of sinful men. That's indescribable humility. Yes. You see, for a fisherman to wash the feet of another fisherman is relatively small sacrifice of dignity. But that Jesus Christ, All right. and I 
want you to listen to how Paul describes him in Colossians 1, verse 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Paul is talking about the creator who would stoop down. And wash dirty feet. He is an Elohim in Genesis chapter 1. When it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He was there in the very beginning when as God he created something out of nothing. He stepped out of nowhere and nowhere became somewhere. And nothing became something. He was there when man was made from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became a living soul. He was there when man turned his back on his creator God. And now the creator God is on his knees washing. Washing their dirty feet. First John three eighteen says, "Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth." And then Peter, and this is pseudo humility. Peter says, "You never wash my feet." Peter's an interesting study. As Jesus loves from disciple to disciple, he finally arrives at Peter, who must have been completely broken. He said with a mixture of remorse and unbelief, Lord, are, are you washing my feet? Jesus said in verse 7, what I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. At this point, Peter may have been still thinking that the kingdom was coming and Jesus was the king. How could he allow the king to wash his feet? It wasn't until after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension that Peter understood the total humiliation of Jesus. So Peter gets even bolder in verse 8. He said, you shall never wash my feet. Now that's a very short sentence, but if you don't mind, I want to tell you exactly what's going on here. To emphasize his words, Peter uses the strongest form of negation in the Greek language. In the original language, this sentence contains a double negative. And those of you who are teachers, you know that you taught us when we were in grade school that we weren't supposed to use a double negative. In English, two negatives cancel each other out. But in Greek, they intensify the negative. And so what Peter literally said, never, never, never shall you wash my feet. He calls Jesus Lord, but now he's acting like he's Lord. How many of us do that? We call Jesus Lord, but we run our own lives. Jesus said, if, you do not, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands. If you give me a bath, I heard Sister Sandra say that when I first read it. Give me a bath. Don't just wash my feet. Wash, wash all of me. There's profound meaning in Jesus' words. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. 
You see, the typical Jewish mindset could not accept the Messiah humiliated. In Peter's mind, there was no place for Christ to be humiliated like this. He must be made to realize that Christ came to be humiliated. If Peter could not accept this act of humiliation, he would certainly have trouble accepting what Jesus would do for him on the cross. But there's another more pro profound truth in Jesus' words. He has moved from the physical illustration of washing feet to the spiritual truth of washing the inner man. Throughout John's gospel, when he dealt with people, Jesus spoke of spiritual truth in physical terms. He did it when he spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. When he spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And when he spoke to the Pharisees in John chapter 9. Now Jesus does it with Peter. He's saying, Peter, unless you allow me to wash you in a spiritual way, you are not clean and you have no part with me. All cleansing in the spiritual realm comes from Christ. And the only way anyone can be clean is if he is washed by regeneration through Jesus Christ. Listen, religion's not going to cleanse anybody. Your best thinking's not going to cleanse anybody. Your best morality's not going to cleanse anybody. Paul told Titus in Titus 3 verse 4 through 7 but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appear not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that having been justified by his grace we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Listen, no man and no woman has a relationship with Jesus Christ unless Christ has cleansed them from their sins. Nobody can enter the presence of the Lord unless he first submits to that cleansing. Peter later did learn the truth. For he says in Acts 4 verse number 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we, we must be saved. We have too many people who want to have their name highlighted in big lights like they are all that in a bag of chips. All of us are simply sinners who have been saved by the grace of God. If you're a member of the body of Christ, and if you're not a member of the body of Christ, you are I'm not a child of God. You are a sinner and you are yet in your sin. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, when we obey the gospel of Christ, we are initially cleansed of all of our past sins, but not until then. Peter offered his hands and his head. He said, wash it all. And Jesus says in verse 10, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. But is completely clean and you are clean, but not all of you. See, there's a difference between a bath and a foot washing. In the culture of that day, a man would take a bath in the morning to get himself completely clean. But as he went through the day, he had to wash his feet from time to time because of the dusty roads. But he didn't have to keep taking baths. All he needed was to wash the dirt off his feet. And when he entered someone's home, Jesus is saying this, once your, your inner man has been bathed in redemption, you are clean. From that point on, you don't need a new bath. You don't need to be redeemed again. Every time you commit a sin, you don't have to go back into the watery grave of baptism. As a child of God, all you need to do is confess your sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 
God. Chapter 1, verse number 9. That verse does not apply to alien sinners. That verse applies only to those who have gone into the watery grave of baptism and have arisen to walk in the newness of life. Jesus said, you all are not clean, for he knew who would betray him. Yes. One might think that should have pricked the heart of Judas. Because Judas knew what it meant. Yes. Those words combined with Jesus washing his feet constituted what would be the last loving appeal for Judas not to do what he was planning to do. That's it. I've always wondered what was going through the mind of Judas. As Jesus is down on his knees, washing his feet. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever it was, it didn't deter Judas from betraying him. And notice what is happening, verse 12 through 17. Then this message is yours. He says, you also ought to wash one another's feet. The Bible says, so when he had washed their, their feet, taking his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, yes. you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. That's right. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Having inserted a parenthetical lesson on salvation, what we might call a sort of theological interlude, Jesus gets back to the real point he is teaching his disciples on this occasion. Yes. That they need to begin to operate based on humility. He argues from the greater to the lesser. If the Lord of glory is willing to gird himself with a towel, take upon him the form of a servant, and wash the dirty feet of sinful disciples, it's reasonable that disciples might be willing to wash each other's feet. The visual example Jesus taught surely did better than a lecture on humility ever would have. Some people, even in our day and age, believe that Jesus was instituting an ordinance for the church. Some, quote, churches, unquote, practice foot washing in a ritual similar to the way we have baptism and communion. But I want to remind you that I believe they are missing the main truth being taught in this passage. Jesus was not advocating a formal ritualistic foot washing service. Verse 15 says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now the word as, the English word, is a translation of the Greek word kathos, K-A-T-H-O-S, which means according as. If he were establishing foot washing as a pattern of ritual to be practiced in the church, he would have used the Greek word ho, H-O, which means that which. Then he would have been saying, I have given you an example that you should do what I have done to you. He is not saying, do the same thing I have done. He is saying, behave in the same manner as I have behaved. He is saying, have the same attitude that I have, and that attitude is a spirit of humility. When are we in the church going to understand that it's not about position and power? us. Yes. Stay in your lane. Yes. 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 
Don't minimize the lesson. Jesus' humility is the real lesson. And it's a practical humility that governs every area of life. Every day of life. In every experience of life. The result of that kind of humility is always loving service. Doing the menial task for the glory of Jesus Christ. That demolishes most of the popular ideas of what constitutes spirituality. Some people seem to think that the nearer you get to God, the further you must be from men. But that's not true. Actual proximity to God is to serve someone else. In terms of sacrificing to serve others, there was never anything Jesus was unwilling to do. Why should we be different? We are not greater than the Lord. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Some of our sister congregations are moving into new buildings. And I've been having discussions with them, Brother Greg, and, and I've said to them, listen, do you need, you need any help? And they said, what are you talking about? I said, do you need any physical labor? I can't do much, but what I can do, I'll come. And they said, are you serious? And I said, yeah. And my wife said, you're crazy. <laughs> she didn't say that, but... <laughs> She said, you got your hands full. You're trying to take care of a church, and you're trying to take care of me. Stop volunteering to help other folk. I said, that's who I am. Amen. Amen. They are my brethren. Those are my brothers and sisters. I am grateful for what God is doing in their life as a church. And I want them to know I have your back, not just in word, but I'm willing to do physical labor if you need it. Where are we going to get out of this idea that we are competing with each other? I'm only competing with the devil. He's the enemy. Not my preaching brethren. Not the elders. Not the deacon. Not the members. The devil is my enemy. Jesus wants us to develop a servant's heart. We are his bond servants, and a servant is not greater than his master. And if Jesus can step down from a position of deity to become a man, then further humble himself to be a servant and wash the feet of 12 undeserving sinners, we ought to be willing to suffer any indignity to serve him. That's true love, and that's true humility. Let me close. Brother Donald said, yes, close. <laughs> no, it's time for me to close. I hope you know this message comes from my heart. His disciples had been guilty of arguing about who would be first in the kingdom of heaven. They were all concerned over who would be the greatest in heaven. But Jesus reminded them that true greatness is a great paradox. Men never earn the respect of others by forced obedience, but they earn the respect of others by first being a servant. Amen. Jesus says that the path to greatness is through humility. This is one of the great paradoxes of the faith. There are several others. The way to life is through death. The way to get is to give. The way to greatness is by becoming a servant to others. From that same lesson of the Tao, the author quoted a poem that he heard at a lectureship years before that, written by Ruth Hans Calkin, entitled, I Wonder. And she asked a question. The poem goes like this, you know, Lord, how I serve you with great emotional fervor 
in the limelight. You know how I eagerly I speak for you at a women's club. You know how I effervesce when I promise or promote a fellowship group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed to a basin of water and asked me to wash the callous feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew. I wonder, have we learned to serve? Have we learned to do menial tasks, tackle ugly jobs, accept dirty assignments, carry out unpleasant responsibilities, often for people who will never say thank you? Yes, Lord. Amen. My Lord, my Lord. Or may even try to hurt us. Yes, because after Jesus washed Judas' feet, Judas still left the upper room and betrayed him. Nevertheless, Jesus has said to each of us, wash one another's feet. You see, in the world, they ask the question, how many people work for you? That, that shows how important you are in the company. But the Lord asks, how many people do you work for? That's a different kind of question. Too many of us are standing in dignity, hands folded, when we should be kneeling in service, washing feet. I told you at the outset of this lesson, but as I have been watching and, and listening and observing and contemplating, that I went deep into myself this week and said, what about you, Terrence? Are your motives right? Are you really a servant? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Are you really willing to diminish so Jesus can increase? Are you more concerned about your dignity and your accomplishments? Or are you more concerned about the souls of men and women, boys and girls everywhere? Because you see, sometimes, sometimes people can force you to almost have to defend yourself. Yes, Amen. And you almost feel like the Apostle Paul, Paul saying, you know, I talk as a fool. So I just got to gotta remind you all who I am. I, I, I am of the Pharisees. That's the stock I came from. I, I sat under the feet of Gamaliel. Don't y'all know who I am? But again, he said, I'm talking like a fool because evidently those are the kind of folk you want to follow. But then he goes on and says, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah, sometimes I want to defend myself. Sometimes it hurts so deeply. That I want to say to people, do you know what I do? When you don't see me, do you know what I'm doing? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do you know what I put up with for 40 something years just to be a minister of the gospel of Christ? But then Jesus always reminds me, son, you have not yet resisted under blood. Amen. You have not yet died Amen. for the cause of Christ. Amen. So you need to close up your pity party. 
And see, the reason he put it that way, because don't nobody come but me. <laughs> you need to close up your pity party, stop whining, and do like Paul. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the pride of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And one day, may not be in this life, but one day... You can say like it said of Paul, I fought a good fight. I, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. One day, if you remain faithful unto the end, you'll hear me say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on up and I'll make you ruler over many. And as I close this sermon and talking about serving good, there are those of you who are not Christians yet. And the reason you're not Christians is because you are unwilling to submit. Right. You're not willing to swallow your pride. All right. You think you're all that no. right now. And that God actually owes you heaven. Got bad news for you all of sin. And come short of the glory of God. Not only do I have bad news for you, the news gets worse. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The first verse was Romans 3.23. This verse is Romans 6.23. You need to hear how Jesus lived, died, and was buried and rose again the third day. The creator put on human flesh, came down, washed the feet of his dirty creation, knowing that the cross was in front of him. Lord, have mercy. He did it for you. Yes, he did. Thank you. He, he did not wait for you to get it together. Thank you, Lord. While we were yet in our sins, sins. he died. And there's a word in that verse that we don't like to say, for the ungodly. That's it. See, if you're not in Christ, you're ungodly. Amen. Plain enough, bro. Scripture, bottom line. But you can get in Christ. Amen. Jesus died for you. Believe that he died, that he was buried. He got up from the grave on the third day. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17, you've heard it today. Believe it. Jesus said, except you believe I am he, you should die in your sins. Where I am, you cannot come. Repent of your sin. And basically all you need to do is repent of running your own life. Yes. Aren't you tired of messing it up? Yes. Your running your own life is what got you in the mess you're in now. And they say a man is crazy. If he keeps doing the same thing over and over and over again, he expects to get different results. Never. Humble yourself. Please. Change your mind, change your will, change your action. That's repentance. Amen. Confess with the mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. And then be buried in water for the remission of your sins. When Saul of Tarsus was baptized in Acts chapter 22, Ananias told him this, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus humbled himself, to, came to the cross. Will you humble yourself and obey the gospel? And if you are a child, a child of God, I'm pleading. Because he shed his blood, all our allegiance belongs to him. Because he shed his blood, 
He's the only reason we have hope in going to heaven. Amen. Stop bragging about your number of followers on Twitter and Facebook yeah, yeah. and all the other stuff they got, Brother Greg. I don't have a Twitter account, don't plan to get one. I think what you, if you got Twitter, you tweet. <laughs> I, I don't need to tweet. Because you know what? All them folk out there in the universe are not going to die for you. But Jesus did. The song of invitation. Let's try have uh, have you been to Jesus? Have we you been to Jesus washing. for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you need to obey the gospel? Do you need to return to the bishop of your soul? Do you just simply need prayer? Will you come right now as we together stand and sing? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed? In the blood. In the blood in the soul in cleansing the blood soul cleansing blood of the land are your garments are your spotless garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed? washed in the blood of the land are you walking daily are you walking daily by the Savior are you washed in the blood of the land? Do you rest each moment? Do you rest each moment in, in the, the crucified? Crucified? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood, in the blood of, of the lamb? The lamb? You may be seated. Are, Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the land, are your garments spotless are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the land? I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Life gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Savior and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me all over and over, over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over, over and over, over and over and over again. Life gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Savior and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your, your patience today. I know I was a little more lengthy than I usually am. Usually lengthy anyway, but a little more lengthy than I usually am, but it was a message that Amen. comes deep from in, inside of, yes, of me. Lord. 
Um, Brother Floyd's death touched me deeply. Amen. Brother Wash McCall's Amen. death touched me, touched me deeply. Uh, tomorrow's not promised to any of us. Today is all we have. I'm thankful to God Almighty, thankful to you. Pray that he was glorified, that Jesus has been lifted up, that, that you are strengthened and that you are, are encouraged. And that those of you who are not yet Christians would understand your only hope is Jesus Christ. Amen. Not man-made religion, not morality, not your job, not your degrees. Your only hope is Jesus Christ. Because he's the only way to the Father. So my prayer is the Holy Spirit will convict you to search the scriptures, to see whether the things are so that I've shared with you today. For those of you who are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I really do love you. Amen. And I am your servant. All right. For Jesus' sake. Yes. yes. Amen. Amen. Let's church say amen. Amen. It's a great sermon. Yes. We've had a number of people come forward. We have a lot of people that are troubled, people that are sick, people that are bereaved, and we all need help. We come from a loving God. We come from a God who as Brother McLean just explained, does not put himself so high above that he can't serve us. Amen. 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 So who do we think we are that we can't serve him and each other? We've had requests for prayer for Sister Regina Williams, she's and her daughter Paris. They're asking prayer for their entire family, our grandkids, kids, mercy, our leaders, sick. Sister Marilyn Stewart is asking prayer for uh, Sister Kenyatta for Traveling Grace. She's also asking prayer for Brother Cottingham and Sister McLean. Amen. Sister Nicole Bird is asking for prayer. She's not feeling well. Let's keep her in mind. Amen. Sister Wade is asking prayer for herself, her husband, her grandkids, and her sons. Keep her entire family in prayer. Mm -hmm. Sister Lawrence is asking prayer for her grandson Eddie and his family, for the Hardens, the Williams and Mildred Brown, uh, Sandy, and for herself. She's been going through a, a lot of pain and suffering, so let's always remember Sister Lawrence. Justin Shields is asking prayer for health. Amen. Sister Kathy Pope is also asking prayer for Sister Jill King, who's not feeling well. Uh, she's asking for the Hamilton family, the Hatton family, the Whitfield family, the Randolph family, the Blair family, the Pope family, and the crew on the USS Nimitz. She's asking prayer for a lot of people there. Nimitz is an aircraft carrier. That's about 5,000 people on one ship. 
she's asking for prayer for Ebony, uh, Ebony Big, Be <laughs> excuse me, Ebony Beckwith is asking prayer for a young lady named Liz who is fighting to win her daughter back from a surrogate. And she's thanking us for prayers for herself and family. Yes. Sister Denise Draper is asking for prayer and would like to make a confession, prayer for herself. She needs regarding uh, family decisions. Did you? Okay. Uh, Sister Doris Smith is asking a prayer to keep her son Joseph and grandchildren in prayer. Please say that. Spar our heads and go to God. Our Lord, our Father, we come before you at this time asking that you would step farther into our lives. We know, Father, that you've done so much for us. Yes. But, Father, we ask that you would come and cleanse our spirits and cleanse our souls, that we could be worthy to come before you. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask that you would heal the sick, comfort the bereaved, Father, we are sinful people. And sin has brought all pain and suffering. All of our problems are due to sin. Father, we ask that you would continue to send your spirit to walk with us and talk with us and guide us and be with us every moment of our lives. We have bereaved families that need your comfort. We know that they will still miss their loved ones, especially this time of year when people want to celebrate and families come together to dine and to visit each other. And it becomes very difficult when they have those members that are not there. But Father, we ask that you would bring some comfort and remind them that those that have gone on are not suffering anymore. That they are at peace, so let us be at peace. Father, we ask that you would guide the hand of the doctors and the caregivers that are looking after our sick. We have a number of people that are suffering from various diseases. Watch over the doctors, the nurses, the, even the cleaning people in the nursing homes, in the hospitals. There are so many that we forget that are doing so much for us. Bless us, bless them, and bless those that are in care that they can have some degree of comfort, and if it be your will, that they can be returned to normal service. Bless us all, Father, that we would do your will, that we remember that the path to righteousness is all around us, for the eye that will see it and the foot that will follow it. Keep us on that path, Father. Mm -hmm. When we stray, have your spirit pick us up. Mm -hmm. Put us back in the direction that we need to go. Father, we ask that we never forget the great sacrifice that has been made for each and every one of us. Christ who was without sin has died for our sins 
a debt that we can never repay, that we will always owe, but that we should never forget that he did pay it. Bless our leadership, our minister, our elders, our deacons. Bless our relationship with each other, that we can love one another, not be petty or jealous of one another, that we can be good Christians. In Christ's precious name, we pray for this in all things. Amen. Now that time that we commune with our Lord and Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ. I trust that everyone has a service packet of the communion, communion items. If not, um, the, the ushers will, will bring one to you. That being stated, let's sing a verse of, sing a verse of this song. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sent from the Father and it thrills my soul just to feel and to know that his blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me. Yes, his grace reaches me and will last through eternity. Now I'm under his control and I'm happy in my soul just to know that his grace reaches me. Good afternoon, good afternoon, church. Today we are um, going to start our communion. Um, as it is written in Mark 14, verses, 12 to 20, verses 22 to 25, it says, As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it, and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Let us all bow our heads pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone that was able to come here. I pray that while we take up the bread and take up the fruit of the vine, that we have pure thoughts and we think of the Lord and his sacrifices for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean. Oh, I'm learning. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. And I'm finding more power than I ever dreamed. Oh, I'm learning, I'm learning to lean on Jesus. I'm learning to lean 
I'm learning to lean. Oh, I'm learning. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. And I'm finding more power than I ever dream. Oh, I'm learning, I'm learning to lean on Jesus. We have come to that part of our service where we have an opportunity to give back to the Lord a portion of what he has given us. God's word says in Luke 6, beginning with verse number 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye met, with all, it shall be measured to you again. Let us go to God in prayer to our Father, our God in heaven. We thank you once again for this opportunity to give into your treasure. Knowing full well, Father, the greatest gift of all that you gave to us, your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. We pray, Father, that as we remember this, that we be cheerful givers this is our prayer in your son Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Remember once again to pray for all of our loved ones, all of our brothers and sisters who have lost loved ones, all of our brothers and sisters who will be going through different procedures in the coming week and continue to pray for our, our young as they continue to do God's will. We pray that they will be leaders and not followers. If there are no other announcements, let us stand for the benediction led by Brother Knight. I'm going to view that holy city. Oh, I'm going to view that holy city one of these days. Hallelujah. I'm going to view that holy city. I'm going to view that holy city one of these days. You know that I, I'm going to meet my loving Jesus. Oh, I. I'm going to meet my loving Jesus one of the day, hallelujah. I'm going to meet my loving Jesus. I'm going to meet my loving Jesus. I'm going to view the holy city one of these days. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, you've given us the opportunity to worship you in yes. spirit and in truth. Yes, sir. It is our prayer that we have glorified your name and your word. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the message and the messenger who delivered that Amen. message so powerfully Amen. today. We pray that you will continue to give him the wisdom and the knowledge to speed up, feed us this spiritual food. Yes. Now, dear Father, as you know, we have a number of people in the brotherhood who are suffering from either illness or bereavement. Yes, yes, sir. We ask that you comfort them in only the way that you can. Now, as we begin to depart from one another, we ask that you be with us, 
In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. 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 Amen.